Sisters, عظم الله أجوركم. Before we start, inshallah, just a couple of announcements to make that the kids club, first and foremost, ends at 8.15 sharp. There's another majlis that starts directly after us, after Adhan. So inshallah, for the love of Imam Hussein, we're, we're able to vacate this room from the sister's side, please, especially as soon as possible, because there is a salah jama'ah here yesterday. As the men were coming in and the salah, it became a bit difficult. So please, as soon as you see Mullah Ali come to the end of the eulogies, I know I'm asking for a lot, my apologies. But if you can exit the room as soon as possible, that would be amazing. For the brothers and also the sisters, mashallah, the attendance each night is growing. So it would be great if before we start, inshallah, we could have a qiyam. So please stand and rise and move towards the middle of the room. Rahmallahu man dhakar al qa'ima min ali Muhammad. Brothers, when the name of Al Qa'im Abdullah Fajr Sharif is recited, please stand up. And if you can, move towards the middle. The brothers on the right, please move towards the middle. For the sisters as well, please come as close as you can to the front. Tonight we're discussing, and Al-Hajj Mustafa Mas'ud will be discussing a very, very important topic in our societies today. The title of the, the majlis today is called Problems with our Mosques. So inshallah, we will welcome Al-Hajj Mustafa Mas'ud with dhikr salati ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Please, a second salawat. For the master of martyrs, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, in a louder voice. A third salawat for the youth who we are remembering today, the son of Imam al Hassan, one of the heroes of Karbala, Al Qasim ibn al Hassan. A third salawat, salla ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله صلى الله عليك يا ابن رسول الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة غريب يا مظلوم كربلاء يا ليتنا كنا معكم سيدي فنفوز فوزا عظيما أما بعد قال الله في محكم كتابه الحكيم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا تقم فيه أبدا لمسجد أسس على التقوى من أول يوم أحق أن تقوم فيه صدق الله العلي العظيم There was a group of people in Medina who felt their position, their status was undermined, was threatened when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam arrived to the city of Medina. These people, they were prominent people in Medina. They were well known in Medina. 
they were the center of attention in Medina. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam arrived in Medina, they felt they were no longer the center of attention. They felt they were no longer the main people in the city because now everyone's around where? Around Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam who's preaching the religion of Islam. One of those people was someone by the name of Abu Amr. Abu Amr was a devout worshipper, a Christian man before Islam. He was someone that would sit down and people would gather around him and he would tell the people that we have in our scripture that there would be a prophet by the name of Muhammad. that is going to come and reveal a new message with a new book he would tell the people this but when rasulullah arrived to medina this abu amr who was the main person the center of attention everyone gathers around him all of a sudden no one really cared about him anymore because now the center of attention was the mercy to mankind rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam so he started getting jealous hatred started to grow inside him and he decided after the battle of Badr to leave Medina and he went where he went to Mecca and he joined with the Kuffar imagine someone who was in Medina who would tell people there'd be a prophet coming with the religion of Islam or with a new religion all of a sudden when he felt his position was threatened he decides to what to leave Medina go to Mecca and join the Kuffar he joins the Mushrikeen and he has also he also participates in the battle of Uhud against the Muslims so much so that he was involved in the injury of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam in the battle of Uhud in the eighth year after Hijrah this Abu Amir Rasulullah took over where Mecca after the conquest of Mecca Abu Amr now noticed that Rasulullah is in control of Medina and Mecca he decides to leave Mecca and he goes towards Sham he has a group who he sends messages to he communicates to with they are where in Medina known as the Munafiqeen the hypocrites in Medina in the ninth year after Hijra, he delivers a message. He communicates with the Munafiqeen there. And he tells them that I want you to build me a mosque. Build a mosque in Medina. In an area called Hay Bani Salim. This is on the outskirts of the city of Medina. He says, build me a mosque there. And invite Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam at the grand opening of this mosque. Make sure Rasulullah comes to this mosque. Rasulullah, when he returns from the battle of Tabuk in the ninth year after Hijra, the Mushrikeen come to him to tell him, come and visit our mosque that we have built, or the Munafiqeen, come and visit our mosque which we have built. And they say, we built this mosque because your mosque, Masjid al Nabi, is quite far. There are some elderly people, old people. They can't come to your mosque. So we're going to build a mosque and we want you to come to the grand opening of this mosque. Tonight, I want to analyze and study and discuss this verse that speaks about this mosque, which later was known as Masjid al Dharar, the harmful mosque. And I want to look at the roles of a mosque. And I want to also discuss the problems within our own mosques. And I want to look at the following points when discussing this. Number one, Abu Amr was a Fasiq. Rasulullah called him a Fasiq. But who was the son of Abu Amr? Number two, the Quran speaks about a masjid of taqwa. Which mosque is the Quran speaking about? Number three, the Quran calls the masjid built by the Munafiqeen as Masjid Dharar. What ended up happening to this Masjid Dharar? Number four, what is the role of a mosque? Number five, 
what is the problems within our own mosques today number six what is the duty of the community towards the mosque and number seven how can a mosque raise leaders and how can a mosque become the center point where we have our upbringing for our youth let us discuss the following points number one we said abu amr was a fasiq but who was the son of abu amr abu amr had a son by the name of hanzala he was later given the title ghasilul malaika why was this hanzala was a devout Muslim some historians say on the night of his wedding the night of his wedding as he is with his wife on that night the caller calls out jihad we are about to start a war jihad against who against the mushrikeen in the battle of Uhud Hanzala has the call that the Rasulullah with his army has left towards Uhud. Hanzala hurries up and joins Rasulullah as if to say, Labbayka ya Rasulullah, I will join you in your battle. The battle takes place. So on one side you have Rasulullah's army with Hanzala. On the other side you have the Mushrikeen with who? with Abi Amr, the father of Hanzala. So the father and the son are facing each other. Hanzala is killed in that battle. Rasulullah goes next to his body. Suddenly the complexions of the face of Rasulullah start to change. The companions ask him, Rasulullah, what is it that you see? Why has your face complexions changed? He said, I have just witnessed Hanzala being washed by the angels. He was given the title Ghasilul Malaika. The companions were confused. How can he be washed by the angels? Why? When they return back to Medina, they ask his wife. They say, this is what happened to Hanzala after they give her the news that her husband has been killed. He's a martyr. She says to them, I was with my husband. We are newly wed. When Hanzala heard the call of jihad, he quickly got up, put his clothes on and left while he was in a state of janaba. And because he heard the call and because he was so eager to join Rasulullah and it wasn't that easy to perform the ghusl like it is today, he did not have time to perform the ghusl so he joined Rasulullah without performing this. That's why he was washed by the angels. Why do I mention the story? I mention the story because I want to say, my dear brothers and sisters, do not judge someone's character based upon their father. Sometimes you have an evil father, but you may have a son that is a good son. And sometimes it's the other way around. You have a father that is good, pious, known in the community, but he will end up with a son that is an evil son. That's a corrupt son. Don't judge people according to their fathers. Number two. So his father orders the building of this masjid. He is using something that is holy, a masjid, to disguise his evil plans. What was his plans? His plans, number one, was to harm the Muslims within the Islamic State, within Medina. And the word Zarar comes from the word Zarar, which means harm. Hence why it was known as Masjid Zarar. Number two, he wanted to strengthen the foundation of the Kuffar. And number three, he wanted to cause disunity between the Muslims. What do I mean? I mean, sometimes you will notice a mosque built and then less than a kilometer away, there's another mosque. You go to the new mosque, you say, why did you build a new mosque? They say, well, we had a fight with the old mosque, so we built a new mosque. 
Is that the reason for you to build the mosque? Of course not. That's why in fiqhi matters we have a concept called there needs to be a masafa bain al masajid between each mosque, masjid, there needs to be a special distance so it doesn't cause disunity within the community. All these destructive ideas were covered up with something that is beautiful. And that's the danger of hypocrisy and hypocrites because they disguise their evil plans with something that seems to be holy and beautiful. The verse tells Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam that do not go towards this mosque. Do not pray in it. Because why? Because there is a masjid that is built and established upon taqwa. لَمَسْجِدٌ أُسِّسَ عَلَى التَّقْوَى مِنْ أَوَّلِ يَوْمٍ أَحَقُّ There's a masjid that is built upon taqwa. Which masjid is this? There are two opinions. The first opinion tells us that this masjid is Masjid Qiba. The second opinion says that it's Masjid al Nabi, where the Holy Prophet is buried. Either way, the point is that this masjid, the intention of building a center, a mosque, must be for the sake of Allah. And Rasulullah ordered his companions to go and destroy this masjid because Al Masajidu Lillah. A mosque must be built for the sake of Allah. And today we must take lessons from this. For example, when we hold a majlis in Muharram, when we hold a gathering in the month of Ramadan, and you ask the organizers, why are you holding this gathering? Why are you doing this majlis? The answer shouldn't be, well, because my father did this and my grandfather did this. Yes, rituals are important. But you must ask yourself, what is the intention of this majlis? And this goes back to the organizers. It must be done in the way of taqwa, in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now when we say a mosque established upon taqwa, what is the role of the mosque? Because taqwa is a fancy word that is used. But what are the actual roles of a mosque? Let's look deeper into the roles of the mosque. Number one, is that role of it being a social place. Number two, an educational place. Number three, a spiritual place. Of course, in this country, for example, and most of the West, we do not have masajid. We have either Husseiniyas or markazes or centers. Why? Because a masjid has to be built in a certain way. There's fiqhi rules about a masjid, how it's built. But a Husseiniyah doesn't have these specific rules. But their roles overlap. And today, for example, alhamdulillah, we are blessed, for example, to be in a city that has, has a lot of Husseiniyahs and a lot of centers for us to visit. What are the roles of this masjid or this center or this mosque? Firstly, we are told that the bi'a, the environment of a person, is influence or influences his values in life. And part of our fitra is ta'aruf and amalul khair. It's part of our being. Our fitra is what? It's to know other people. No one wants to live a lonely life. Everyone wants to make friends, wants to socialize. It's part of our fitra. And amalul khair, to do good is also part of your fitrah. And Allah says this in the Holy Quran. وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلًا لِتَعَارَفُوا We made you tribes, nations, so you get to know one of, one, one of each other. I go to the, to the mosque, to the center, to know people. Ta'aruf. The second one is amalul khair. To do good. This is part of your fitra. Allah and the Holy Quran says, He wants to do good acts. Or oh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, In another verse. In another verse. 
they race towards doing good today for example you'll notice before Muharram by a few weeks you'll see the organizers of Majalis the youth they leave their work they leave their family they put everything aside they make sure they go to their Husseiniyah they put the sawad up they make sure the sound is working the cameras are installed the lighting Yusar'oon they race towards doing good this is part of our fitra how do you evolve this fitra that's inside you how do you develop this ta'aruf this amalul khair through what through the mosque through the Husseiniya, through your center you evolve and develop these fitra this natural feeling that you have for doing good and for ta'arif to know other people therefore the first role of a masjid a mosque is to socialize what does that what does this do to me number one it gives me a sense of belonging number two a sense of unity number three a sense of brotherhood when i come to the husseiniyah i feel a sense of security i have people with me who are mualin of Amir al muminin I have this sense of pride. I have this sense of feeling important because we are all commemorating for the same cause. It builds my character. As in, if from a young age, I've spent all my life in Muharram al Ramadan, in the Husseiniya, this helps me build my character. Number two, a sense of unity. Allah and the Holy Quran says you are one ummah, ummatun wahida. It makes me feel united when I stand alongside my brothers in prayer, alongside my sisters in salah, alongside my brothers in the majlis. A sense of unity, a sense of brotherhood. And I feel that at the mosque. That's the first role to socialize. Number two at the mosque is that role of being an educational center. My education, my ma'rafa, knowing my religion, knowing my fiqh, knowing my theology, where does it come from? It comes from the Husseiniyah, comes from the masjid, it comes from the mosque. I listen to a lecture, I listen to a mawadha, a reminder about my religion. I listen to, for example, poetry. This all brings me closer to Allah and educates me. Because at the moment, sadly, and this has been not just now in this generation, but also maybe in previous generations, more so in this generation, we've become a generation that doesn't like to read. How many people actually pick up a book and read? Therefore, the Husseini, the masjid becomes that center point where I get educated. Number three, the spiritual side of the mosque that's why for example when we do a'mal laylatul qadr if you do the same a'mal at home you will not feel spiritual but if you do it in a community in a mosque it gives you that spiritual upliftment allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that in this mosque rijalun yuhibbun an yatatahharu there are people in this mosque that want to be purified. Is this the purification of dirt? On the first level, yes, physical impurity. But on the higher level, it's that purification of the soul. I feel when I come to the Husseiniya, I am purifying my soul. Allah and the Holy Quran says, La ta'mal absar. It's not the eyes that go blind. It's the hearts that go blind. And I come to the mosque, to the Husseiniya, to purify my heart, to build a connection with Allah. And this probably is the main role of a mosque, to feel spiritual, give you that ruhaniya that you might not feel at home. That's why, for example, I see sometimes a few brothers, or I call them, I say, I didn't see you at the Husseiniyah. I didn't see you at the mosque. He says, Wallah, I was watching it online. Watching it online very well. Alhamdulillah, we have a team that works behind the scenes to make sure that it goes live for people that can't make it. 
number one. Number two, I know there are some people that still fear the COVID virus. Of course, restrictions sometimes are in place, but if you take the right precautions, and we hope that inshallah, this COVID will finish very soon if you take, take the right precautions, there's no harm in attending a majlis. In fact, you should be attending and supporting a majlis because you feel that spiritual upliftment at the masjid, which you might not feel at home. And if all of a sudden now it becomes a trend, that's the problem. When it becomes a trend for people to what? To attend the majalis at home. The hadith of Imam Sadiq alayhi afdal salatu was salam doesn't say attend at home. It says, atajlisuna wa tatahadathun. Do you sit down together? and congregate together with the majalis. Therefore, this level of spirituality is only felt at a Husseiniya. Now, to the main crux of the lecture. What are the problems with our mosques? Someone read the title earlier on today and he messaged me, he said, Muhajji Mustafa, you're going to get in real trouble with this title. I said, no. Number one, I'm not speaking about the problems to attack anyone, not at all. Alhamdulillah, I am blessed to attend maji, many majalis, different communities, from the Iraqi to the Iranian, to the Afghanistani community, to the Khoja community, to the Pakistani community, to other Arabic communities like the Lebanese and the Bahraini community. Alhamdulillah, I am blessed that I attend a lot of these majalis. And I'm honored that I attend these majalis. And I learn from their experience. But my issue when it comes to the problems within our mosques is that we must criticize our mosques so they raise their level and become better. I mention my problems within my mosques, not to attack my mosques, no. I am honored that I grew up in the mosques in London. I am sitting in front of you as Mustafa because I grew up in these mosques. Because I listen to the lectures in these mosques. It's my honor to be attending these majalis. But today there are problems within our mosques that must be addressed. Otherwise, why would there be youth running away from the mosques? Why are youth running away from the Husseiniyas? There are problems within our mosques. They must be addressed for us to become a better community, not in an attackful way. So what are the problems within our mosques? Number one, there is no elected committee. No membership. Who's in charge of the mosque? That same person that's been in charge for 40, 50 years. There is a sense, again, I'm careful with, with, with what I say because these are my, this is my community, my mosque. There is a sense of nepotism in our mosques. It's that same family, that same group of people that run the mosque. The problem with that, someone might say, what's the problem with that? The problem with that is the community has no choice with what happens in the mosque. I decide who speaks, who the radud is, what time we start, what time we end, if it's English or Arabic, the mosque decides. The community has no say. But again, there is no membership. And I'll come to some solutions, by the way. So I'm not going to only mention the problems. Number two. I'm going to get, inshallah, bonus points for this. The treatment of women within our mosques. Do the women in our mosques have a role? What is the role of women within our mosques? Alhamdulillah, for example, al Harak al Husseiniyah this year, they decided, they said, if we want to do our majlis, and again, I'll mention this center, who have welcomed us throughout the last two years before COVID, we were here till today, alhamdulillah. And they have opened their doors to us. And Harak al Husseiniyah insisted that when we do the English program, the women are in the same hall as the men. Someone might say, you know, that's, that's not right. Women and men should be segregated. I don't like my daughter to be in the same hall as the men. You're okay with your daughter being in university in the same hall. That's fine. With a non-Muslim. That's fine, uncontrolled environment. But in a controlled environment, in a Muslim atmosphere, you have a problem. Where's the common sense? Where's the logic? Of course, we say maybe the, the elder community, they want a segregation, that's up to them. 
But the second problem, in my opinion, again, in my opinion might not mean anything, is the role of women. Number three, I said the role of a mosque is what? Educational, social, spiritual. Ask those attending the Husseiniyas, don't ask me. Do they get educated when they go to the Husseiniyah? Do they feel spiritual? Do they come out and say, I felt really spiritual after that majlis? Do they socialize in the mosque? Have you heard? Again, I criticize so we raise our level. These are our centers. Do, does any mosque have a social event where they say, this mosque is going to hold a football tournament for the youth, a swimming session for the sisters? Have, have you heard any of this? So is there a social? Does anyone feel spiritual? And again, when you ask the youth, why don't you feel spiritual or educated? They say, well, uh, I was born here. I'm 30 years old now. I've got a family. And I don't understand Arabic. And I'm sitting there in the lecture and I don't understand the word. Is it my problem that I was born here and I got my education here? No, it's not. The fourth problem. There is no English lectures in our mosques. Where's the English lecture? Downstairs in the basement. Where is the English lecture? In that room. That small tiny room, you see it? Where the kids are? It's there. The father comes. Again, I'm criticizing so we become better. The kids go to the English and the father goes to the Arabic. Very well. But the English is always secondary. We live in London, this community, this specific Iraqi community has been living here for 30, 40 years. Till today, most of our mosques say no to English. And then they say, why are the children not coming to the mosque, the youth? Where are they? We've opened our doors. Habibi, they don't understand anything that you're saying. How can the youth connect with the speaker if the speaker is not talking to their level, does not understand their issues and their problems? Therefore, that's... Another problem. Number five, and again, I, there's many reasons, many problems, but I'll mention only the, these five. Number five is there is no youth involvement. And this is a very important and key point. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, those around him that supported the message of Islam were all youth. Were all youth. Why? Because youth have energy, taqa. Why am I going to let my youth from my community go and waste that energy outside of my mosques? Let me involve them in the mosque. The youth want to be heard. They have opinions. Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi afdal salati wa salam says, Do not force your children on your own traditions. One of those is the language barrier. There's a real issue. Now, these are the problems. Let's look at some solutions. And the solutions start with us. There's a problem within us, the community members. Number one, when we go to the centers, let us go with a pure intention for the sake of Allah. I won't go to this Husseiniya because my friend is running it. I go to this Husseiniya because they're from Najaf and I'm from Najaf. I go to this Husseiniya because they're from Karbala. I'm from Karbala. I'll go to this Husseiniya because they follow this marja and I follow this marja. Again, these issues do not let them divide us. Go for the sake of Allah. Number two. Dress well when you go to the center. There's no harm in putting a bit of fragrance and smelling good. Come in Islamic hijab, both men and women, when you come to our centers. Be someone that represents the school of Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi salam. I once saw a 16-year-old in Ramadan. I said, why don't you come to the Husseini anymore? He said, Ammu, all the people around me, they smell funny. Allah in the Holy Quran says, خُذُوا زِينَتَكُمْ عِنْدَ كُلِّ مَسْجِدْ Beautify yourself when you come to the masjid. There's no harm in putting a bit of fragrance and smelling good when you come to the masjid. Especially the brothers. Number three, make sure you establish, not pray, you establish your salah in the masjid. Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi afdal salati wa salam says, بَقَائِي فِي الْمَسْجِدْ أَحَبُّ إِلَيَّ مِنْ بَقَائِي فِي الْجَنَّةِ 
my stay in the masjid is better than being in paradise ask anyone now what what they would prefer say, I just want to leave the Husseini as soon as the masjid is over as soon as the majlis is over the masjid should make you what make you want to be there and spend time there number four and very important give back to the community give back to your centers we only want I'll give a small example. You take the food, tabarruk, you open it, oh, timman uqima again. Oh, timman, or you get, you open it and it's not timman uqima. When are they going to make timman uqima? Have you given back to your Husseiniyas? Let's be honest with each other. Has anyone said, Ani, every year in Muharram, I'm going to pay 1,000 pounds to the Husseiniya for the cooking? Late al Abbas is on me. Leiltum al is on me. We're a community that's not used to giving back to our centers. If you want, if we want, I say, to hold our mosques accountable, we must be ready to give back and have membership in our Husseiniyas. Other communities are doing it. Have a membership in our Husseiniyas where we pay towards the mosque. Then we can hold them accountable for what they do. And finally, number five, and this advice is for me before anyone else. Forgiveness, kindness, and respect. Be ready to forgive very quickly. When Hur comes to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam to ask for tawbah, Imam doesn't tell him, why did you do this? Why did you do that? Why did you stop me? Why did you cut the water? He said, you're forgiven. When someone comes to ask for forgiveness, don't ask for reasons. Forgive them. Be kind to everyone in the Husseiniyas. There's an etiquette that I, as a child, used to have. That when I come in the Husseiniyya and I see an older man coming in, I straight away, if I'm sitting on a chair, I move and I let him sit. This is died. Doesn't exist anymore. Khatiya, old man, comes. He's been serving the community for 40, 50 years. He can't find the chair to sit on. He has to come and sit in the middle. Why? Kindness and respect to our elders. Yes, there may be a language barrier, a cultural barrier, but that does not mean we disrespect anyone. And these are some solutions, of course. There are many more, but for the sake of time, these are some solutions when it comes to us improving our mosques. Because our mosques, they are educational. That's their role, to be educational, to be a social place, and also to be a place that I feel spiritual. And a mosque upbringing will create leaders, will make leaders. Alhamdulillah, today we have youth organizations in London. And I mentioned this a few days ago. These youth organizations that have this taqa and this energy, bring them within our mosques and tell them, I'm going to make a youth committee and you're in charge. Let's remove this sense of nepotism within our own mosques. Let's give opportunity to our youth. Instead of using their energy elsewhere, let them use it in the mosque. Because the people that were around Rasulullah were who? Were youth and poor people. This is another problem sometimes we have. The youth comes, he's dressed in a certain manner. Or his hair's done in a certain manner. That's his culture. He was brought up here. In his culture, that is fine. Straight away, straight away they'll look down on him. Why is he coming to the Husseiniya? Tell him not to come anymore. Rasulullah, those that surrounded him were from different backgrounds, the rich, the poor. Someone from the tribe of Bayava, which is an Arab tribe, comes to the Prophet's mosque one day. Rasulullah is sitting with his companions. This person comes to the mosque. This person's rich. He's from the rich Arabs in Medina. He comes to the mosque. He wants to sit next to Rasulullah. He's a Muslim. He wants to sit next to Rasulullah, but there's no space next to Rasulullah. 
the likes of Bilal is sitting, Hudayfa, Khabbab, Ammar ibn Yasir. You know, most of them were not non-Arabs, and most of them were poor. They were seen as people from a lower class. They were around Rasulullah. This man comes, he wants to sit next to Rasulullah. He looks at the space, there is nowhere to sit. He stands next to one of the poor people and he tells him, Ya ibn Fulana, he calls him by his mother's name. You see me standing and you do not make space next to me, next to your, you do not move and make me space next to Rasulullah. Rasulullah, he sees this. He calls him after the majlis is finished. He tells him, who was around me? What people did you see? He says, I saw the black, the white, the Arab, non-Arab, the poor, the rich. Rasulullah tells him, you are not better than any of them except through taqwa. If I hear you do what you did again, I will get rid of you from the mosque. You are all the same, equal in the eyes of Allah. Then he calls this other person who's poor. He calls this other person. He tells him, this companion wants to ask for your forgiveness. The poor companion says, I forgive him, Rasulullah. It's fine. The rich man says, the rich companion says, I want to give him, because he's forgiven me, I want to give him half of my wealth so he can forgive me. Look at the answer of the poor man, the poor companion. He says, no, Ya Rasulullah, I don't want half of his money. He says, why? He says, because if I take half of his money, I might become like him. I don't want it. Of course, I'm not saying that all rich people are like this, no. But sometimes, again, sometimes, and again, I'm only mentioning this as a reminder, and it's a reminder for myself before anyone else, to say, my dear brothers, my dear sisters, don't look at someone's car or how much is in their bank account or if they're rich or if they're poor to show them respect or disrespect, to let them come to the Husseiniya and not come to the Husseini. Because at the end of the day, we'll all be in that white kefen, six feet under. Therefore, the role of the mosque is a very important role to build leaders. And when we look at the example of Karbala, we see a young man who was brought up in the mosque of Muhammad. He was brought up in the house of Ali and Hassan and Hussein. And narrations mention he was 13 on the day of Ashura. But the mosque upbringing and of course, his house is a mosque. No one doubts that the house of Imam al Hassan al Mushtaba, the house of Imam al Hussein, is a mosque. On the night of Ashura, when Imam al Hussein alayhi afdalu salati was salam tells his companions of their martyrdom, Al Qasim comes and he says, Sayyidi, Ya Am, you told everyone of their martyrdom, but you did not tell me of my martyrdom. Imam al Hussein tells him, Bunay Qasim, Kayfa tara al maut? How do you see death? He responds in the most beautiful manner. In that manner that you know this person is someone that was brought up in the mosque of Muhammad and Al Muhammad. He says, If it's for you, Aba Abdullah, Ahla min al Asal. I see it sweeter than honey. And on the day of Ashura, he would come many times to ask his uncle Aba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam for permission. But Imam al Hussein would say no. He'd say, Qasim, you remind me of my brother Hassan. And he would go back to his mother saying, My uncle Hussein is not letting me go until she gives him that letter from his father. To say, Bunay Qasim, if you see your uncle Wahid and Farida, Fala to Qasr fi Nusrati. And Al Qasim goes towards his uncle to seek permission from him.
افسحوا المجال اخوان افسحوا المجال لجفة القاسم Sit down, please. Sit down. Stretch, my lord. Stretch, my lord. Stretch, my lord. يا 
entered the battlefield wearing his father's turban and holding his father's sword he would say in tankuruni fa'ana najlu al-hasan sibtu al-nabiy al-mustafa wal-murtahan adha huseinun kal asir al-murtahan if you do not know me then i am the son of imam al-hasan and if you do not recognize me then i am the grandson of rasulullah Qasim was born for this day. Let me take you back 10 years before this day on the 50th year after Hijrah in the month of Safar. Imam Al Hassan was on his deathbed. Al Qasim was only two or three years old. Imam Al Hussein is sitting next to his brother Imam Al Hassan. Imam Al Hassan says, My beloved brother Hussein, this is my son Qasim. Look after him. He is under your care. He brings Al Qasim. He's only three years old. Imam Al Hussein takes care of him. For 10 years, Imam Al Hussein is looking after him. His mother is waiting for the day that he gets married. Ask any mother, my dear brothers and sisters. Is the happiest moment of a mother's life is to see her son married. That's why when Qasim came to her, she gave him that letter. It was the letter from his father and he kissed it. It was to say that do not leave your uncle Wahid and Farida. Qasim enters the battlefield fighting bravely, killing many of the enemies. He is wearing sandals on his feet as he is going towards the battlefield. One of the, ro one of the strings on his sandals break. He bends over to fix the sandals. As he bends over to fix the sandal, a Lain by the name of Amr ibn As'ad al Zaydi, Amr ibn al As'ad al Azdi, goes towards Al Qasim. A man next to him says, Do you not see all the enemies around him? Leave this young boy. His face is shining like a full moon. This person, Amr, goes towards Al Qasim, takes his sword, strikes Al Qasim on his head. Al Qasim screams out, Alayka min salam ya am ya aba abdullah. Imam Al Hussein goes running like a lion towards the battlefield. He finds Qasim. When the dust settles, there is that scene. Aba Abdullah is standing next to Al Qasim's head. And Al Qasim is moving his feet in pain. Imam Al Hussein stands there and he says, عز والله على عمك أن تدعوه فلا يجيبك أو يجيبك فلا ينفعك القاسم opens his eyes he sees his uncle in his final moments his feet are moving from the pain when Qasim's soul departs from his body this breaks the heart Imam Al Hussein this young boy is only 13 when Imam Al Hussein is carrying him he places him on his chest this young man's feet start to drag on the plains of Karbala Imam Al Hussein is in so much pain that he cannot carry Qasim's body he brings Qasim's body where does he place it he places Qasim's body next to the body of Ali Al Akbar two martyrs next to each other two cousins next to each other then Ramla comes in out of respect Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam leaves the tent Ramla opens her hijab she opens her hair then she says my son Qasim I wanted to be you to be married instead of your henna my son Qasim your blood is filled الحسين بحق الحسين إش في صدر الحسين بضم يوم ذكريني توقعت توقعت
من تيمور زفت شبايا من العير اسم حروم حنيتي دم المصايب You all know the words my dear brothers يوم ذكري من تيمور زاف الشبايا من العير اسم حروم حنيتي دم المصاب شمعة شبابي من يطفو My whole life I've wanted to make you proud To make you happy It's all that I ever found My youth's been taken I lay in my shroud Mother, my whole life I've wanted to make you proud يوم ذكريني من تمور زاف الشباب من ثاد النبا راضي بصاف الحليب وبها الشهادة صار لي قسم ونصيب حفيت بدمي خلي فرشهم حنيت دمي والشفاء الذار ترى Shabab, the way you've raised me, I'd give my life for Hussein. Mother, 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 forgive me if I've caused you pain. Please don't forget me when my time has come. Mother, my whole life I've wanted to make you proud. Your Tonight is a night for the youth. Please rise in honor of Qasim ibn al Hassan as we pledge our allegiance to Aba Abdullah al Hussein and we pledge our allegiance to Qasim ibn al Hassan the same way that he did to Imam al Hussein on the day of Ashura in the land of Karbala. Please make some space for the Qasim to exit, please.
أحسنتم جزاكم الله خير جزاء موفقين لكل خير. Please now prepare for the eulogies for Qasim ibn al Hassan. I want all the youth in front of me. Today is an important day, an important night, especially for the youth. So please come as far forward as you can and take part within the eulogies and the recitations and prepare for the eulogies and the recitations. I أحسن يا حسين ويم صاب Allah, <laughs> Qasim ibn Hassan says to you, every single one of you, he says, O oh youth, if I can kindly ask the brothers and sisters, especially those who are leaving, to keep as quiet as possible, and especially the ones in the front, to pay his attention. O oh youth, hear me. This is a message directly to the youth. Hear me, my tragedy, when you mourn and remember. O oh youth, hear me, my tragedy when you mourn and remember. Hear my story, hear my glory, and help me live forever. Because on that day, my uncle taught me. On that day, my uncle taught me. Live like Ali, die like. Thank you very much. One person in this whole hall can say for saying, Live like Ali, die like. Live like Ali, die like. Oh, you hear me? My tragedy. When you mourn and remember. Hear my story. Hear my glory. And help me live forever. On that day, my uncle taught me. Live like Ali, die like Hussein. On that day, my uncle taught me. Live like Ali, die like. On that day, my uncle taught me. Live like Ali, die like Hussein. On that day, my uncle taught me. Live like Ali, die like. Oh, youth, hear me, my tragedy, when you mourn and remember. Oh, youth, hear me, my tragedy, when you mourn and remember. Hear my story, hear my glory, and help me live forever. On that day, my uncle taught me, live like Ali. Live like Ali. Hey, live like Ali. Die like. Oh youth, when you recall me and for me weep. Oh youth, when you recall me and for me weep. The lessons of my story in your tears keep. I saw my uncle alone and wouldn't sleep. I tell you the tears he shed, angels would sweep. I tell you the tears he shed, angels would sweep. Feeling guilty, Aramla saw me take Hassan's armor and shield. She cried for me, none could make me throw down my sword and yield. I told my mother, please let me leave this tent and my death attain on that day my uncle taught me
On that day my uncle taught me live like highly On that day my uncle taught me Oh youth no by two names I was left in Oh youth no by two names I was left in I'm young but I can't explain the things I saw Four years for a man named Ali, tears would pour The pride of his name every man near me wore The pride of his name every man near me wore I saw a pride that never died We were the sons of Ali In all of us they all loved us and this Every day see in all of us they all loved us and this every day I see a promise that lived inside me a pride my actions would maintain on that day my uncle taught me Hussein on that day my uncle taught me live like Ali live like Ali live like Ali I was young when they killed my father Hassan I was young when they killed my father Hassan Every I would look at me as an orphan All alone and came to wipe my head a man Now he's all alone and to help him I can Now he's all alone and to help him I can When I was young to me he'd come and he'd become my father What has become he has no one He's calling for a helper What kind of son would Qasim be If all alone he would remain On that day my uncle taught me Live like Live like Ali Die like On that day my uncle taught me Live like Ali Live like Ali Live like Ali I lived my life in my grandfather's shadow. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. I lived my life in my grandfather's shadow. From my morals, my love for Ali, they'd know. And on that day, his words to the world I'd show. Yesterday has gone, uncertain's tomorrow. Yesterday has gone, uncertain's tomorrow. Work within this world, he would say, as if you will live forever. Work within this world, he would say, as if you'll live forever. And as if you'll die tomorrow, work toward the hereafter. Today's my day, I'll work for me to be known as Qasim the slave. Today's my day, I'll work for me to be known as Qasim the slave. On that day, my uncle taught me. Live like Ali. Live like Ali. On that day my uncle taught me live like die like my uncle had a love of Ali so grand my uncle had a love for Ali so grand for being his son he was led to this land all his sons the name Ali on their hearts band He'd name all Ali if he had a thousand He'd name all Ali if he had a thousand I saw Hussein, he loved this name It left my uncle in trance A young lion, I embraced him And with this great name I pounced Ali's zeal flowed inside me I'd make the enemy's blood rain On that day my uncle told on that day my uncle taught me live like live like Ali oh 
live like Ali My grandfather of this day he was aware My grandfather of this day he was aware He knew who died for Hussein and how and where if he's watching, how can I into life step? How can I live if he wanted me killed here? How can I live if he wanted me killed here? I left my tent, and I'm led lament by her cries to war. I'm led her drips. Her tears drip down my wedding gown To her nightmares I have fed If fate wanted me to marry I'd not have seen Karbala's plane On that day my uncle taught me Live like Ali Live like Ali Live like Ali On that day my uncle taught me Live like Ali Live like Ali I live like Ali I'd cry out pretending my voice was thunder I'd cry out pretending my voice was thunder I am the hero of Uhud and Badr I'd pretend I was the one struck on Qadir So young but I wanted to be like Haidar So young but I wanted to be like Haidar So young and yet still they feared me I hope my grandfather is proud I imagined I was Ali Leaving in all Badr's crowd Ali you're the father of dust accept me as one of its grains on that day my uncle taught me on that day my uncle taught me live like Ali die like live like Ali live like Ali oh youth on that day I learned many lessons Oh youth on that day I learnt many lessons And because of it my name in hearts glistens When they realized I was of Hassan's orphans Their sword called out my name and death it listens Their sword called out my name and death it listens Swords cut through me, death embraced me me, arrows at me they propel I was murdered and massacred I learned this from my uncle and perhaps Hussein learned from me like me his throat cut vein to vein on that day my uncle taught me on that day my uncle taught me live like Ali louder live like Ali live like Ali Live like Ali Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah wa ala al arwah allati hallat bi finaik Alaykum minni jami'an salamu Allah abadan ma baqeet wa baqiya al-layl wa al-nar wa la ja'alahu Allah akhir al-ahdi minni li ziyaratikum Assalamu ala al-Husayn wa ala Ali ibn al-Husayn wa ala awlaad al-Husayn wa ala ashab al-Husayn خصوصا سيدي ومولاي أبي الفضل العباس وقته زينب جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته إلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات رحم الله من قرأ سورة المباركة الفاتحة مع الصلوات